right, it's Graphic Policy Radio. This is your host, Ilana Levin, a.k.a. Twitter's Ilana Brooklyn, and this is a comics podcast. This is a comics podcast for comics lovers who appreciate stories with believable queer female friendships at their heart, and nerds writing about nerds, and want queer comics by queer people telling new stories about new worlds. That's right, we're talking about a hot new graphic novel today called Renegade Rule with two of its creators. And here's a rundown about the story. The Manhattan Mist have beaten the odds to land themselves in the national championships for Renegade Rule, one of the hottest virtual reality games in existence. But they're in the the competition fiercer than they've ever imagined. And one team member's entire future could be at stake. Four queer female friends will have to play harder than ever against self-doubt, infighting, romantic distraction, and a slew of other world-class teams if they hope to become champions. From Ignatz-nominated writer Ben Kahn, debut author Rachel Silverstein, and artist Sam Beck is a celebration of friendship, competition, queer identity, and the insane things we do for the things and people we love. Welcome to an interview with the two writers of Renegade Rule. Uh, Joining me again uh, is Ben Kahn. Ben is an Ignatz Award-nominated comics writer. Their previous works include the comic series Heavenly Blues from Scout Comics and Griffin Galaxy's Most Wanted from SBI Press. They can usually be found shuttered away in their shoebox-sized New York apartment, afraid to leave the city. And sometimes they can be found on my podcast, where they have been on to talk about Doom Patrol, as well as their other comics. Welcome back to the show. Ah, Thank you so much for having me back on. It is always so much fun. Yay! And joining me for the first time is Rachel Silverstein. Rachel is a recent law school graduate. Renegade Rule is her first comic book publication. Also has she also has a master's degree in elephant paleontology. Really? Wow. <laughs> welcome welcome to the show, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. I always felt like ele- elephants deserve the best and we've just given them the worst. And it's so tragic and evil. They deserve the best lawyers, and that's why they call me. Oh, you're an elephant lawyer. Thank you. <laughs> dun, dun. Not really, but I always make oh. that joke. Oh. Well, they, they do exist, but... <laughs> They're the elephants who catch the criminals and the elephants who judge them. These are their stories. <laughs> well, thanks, thanks, you guys, for joining me. I, I really enjoyed the comic. It was really a pleasure. And, um, you know, I'm not someone who plays video games. Uh, I mean, I've played video games, but I don't, I don't actively play video games. And um, I really enjoyed it regardless. But this is definitely a story rooted in... People, you know, playing games and gaming. Uh, Tell me a little bit about how the book came to be. Yeah, so I really wanted to work on something together with Rachel. And, um, you know, so I was trying to come up with something. And, you know, I'm a big lover of sports movies and sports manga and sports anime uh, and that general story. Um, And I know that Rachel was really, really into Overwatch at the time. So in my head, I was trying to think of something where, like, we could maybe do together and this kind of esports space like where instead of being the trapped in the vr space it was just a straight sports story kind of formed and i was overjoyed that rachel wanted to work on it and then we just had the most fun time i've ever had making a book together i love it and rachel this is this is your first comic it is and i'm very lucky to have befriended ben a couple years ago and that they wanted to work on a book with me. So it has truly been an honor to write Renegade Rule with you, Ben. Uh -uh. It's been a joy. Are you guys both like hardcore video game fans or obviously the sports manga connection for real, but... um... Comics are better with Rachel writing them. Aw. So how did you guys get connected with the artist, Sam Beck? Right. So uh, I actually found Sam on Twitter and we just kind of went for it and I messaged her and I said, hey, are you available for comic work? We're working on a story about uh, girls on a virtual reality like video game team. Would you be interested? And we were really lucky. She said yes. And yeah, it's been a blast working with her. Sam is so much fun to work with. It's always great as writers when you're working with an artist that you know can just nail any body language any facial expression it's such a relief knowing that you're working with someone that can just that 
the art is just going to be able to nail and carry so much emotion and the the life Sam imbues these characters with is just so awesome and wonderful. Well, the character designs that you guys did is just great. It's so nice to see like actual body diversity. It's so nice to see um, like characters in a range of gender expression, you know, butch and femme and in between and complex and uncategorizable and just like everybody in here. Um, and everybody has different bodies and faces, you know, which is not something that uh, a lot of the comics seem to pull off ever. <laughs> yeah, no, I... Again, I, I have to just have to give so much credit to Sam, who's just so awesome and wonderful and just really giving them the such unique, again, letting them be real people, look like real people, have all the variety that comes with human and queer existence and just Sam's the best. And also have Sam's nice clothes. So there you and, go. Uh, yeah. Oh, dope clothes. Dope fashion. So how dope did you guys... That- and also Jesse's tuxedo t-shirt. Sweat <laughs> yes, combo. that showing up showing up at the at the fancy gala with this tuxedo t-shirt was was wonderful. I am um, I feel like this is an indie book. I want to keep the conversation spoiler free, but my definition of spoilers is like pretty um over the top. You know what I mean? So we can pretty much talk about everything. Pretty Yay. much. Yeah, um, we've, we've got some see we've got some twists and turns in the book that we know we want to save for people when people read it. Which yeah, is how these yeah. matches go. Yes, exactly. I think that's a good way to define spoilers versus, you know, not. And um, so uh, how does the character design process work? Because you guys had to create, you know, multiple teams. Well, you know, you're rooted in these four lead characters, but a lot of people get developed in general. And there's a lot of just really good individuality here. Uh, I mean, uh, most of the focus, at least on our end, was in terms of development and really thinking through the characters, was really on the four uh, main girls in the Manhattan Mist and the main uh, rival, Gabby, uh, Gabby, from the Brooklyn Sharpshooters. Because we, we couldn't resist just showing absolute New York bias in, these mm-hmm, te- definitely. in this book. Un- unapologetic New York bias. Yeah, that was one of the real pleasures of reading this during COVID. I-, I was reading this before I started going to like anything, basically. And um, there was recognizable Manhattan and it just gave me feelings. It was nice getting to uh, put a little of our, you know, put a little of the city into the world and like try to make it as much of a VR story, but a little bit of a New York story, too. But, yeah, a lot of the characters was based in... We put a lot of work and thought into their classes, their weapons, how that would work, like their what kind of color schemes they would have, and um, and really just make, trying to make sure that they captured the right vibe. Um, and, again, Sam is just awesome right from the get-go. And then with the other teams, it was definitely a little more kind of you know we can aim of like the team concept the team colors and then just like what wacky character class would they have and then really it was just fun being like all right like here's some robots and pirates i'm really excited to see how sam is going to draw this you know one of the pleasures of reading this is sort of like i I, you know i've talked a bit about the comic die on the show i've had kieran gillen and stephanie hans on and i've also played the die rpg and in the die rpg you invent a real world character that you're playing and that character invents a character that they're playing within the world of Die, which is the uh, fantasy role playing game that they're in. And, you know, there's something really fun about inventing the real person and then inventing the fictional character that that real person plays, which is like kind of the central piece of, of this book and story. Oh, yeah, that was a lot of fun planning. Honestly, I think we probably had more fun planning their real world fashions and outfits than their in-game costumes. Yeah. Because that was, and again, like, I think, you know, kind of speaks to, like, I kind of started really discovering kind of my own gender identity and fashion when, like, around the time when we started working on this book. So it just be, was so much fun, like, finding these characters' identities through the fashions, the fashions that they wear and the fashions they choose in the game world. Hmm. How did you guys decide, I, I mean, and your general philosophy about what, you know, how people, hmm, how, what is your philosophy about what are people's philosophies about what classes they play in video games? Like when they choose if they want to be a tank or a sharpshooter or, or wizard or what have you. 
I think for this, we were really looking for funny contrast to kind of drive a lot of like character and humor. So I think we tried to look at a lot of like, well, what would you typically expect from these character classes? And then how can we do the exact opposite? So that's how you get the super mean, angry healer, the space cadet sniper, and our sugar cream puff heavy weapons expert. <laughs> yeah. I think people like are often do that in the real world too. You know, I, 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 um, I, I don't play video games, like I said, but I do play RPGs and I tend to try to create characters that I don't feel like are Mary Sue's of myself or like some, like too close to real. Cause I don't know. They're just something that feels I, 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 uh, more power to people who like to play that way. But for me, it's not, I don't know. It makes me feel we, uncomfortable. We definitely wanted uh, Sasha, the healer character to just be really relatable to every white mage and healer who's ever had to deal with a party that would not stop being stupidly reckless. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The rage of stop drying. Don't make me have to fucking save you is like right in the beginning, right <laughs> in the beginning of the story. Do you guys play a lot of those kinds? Of, I mean, they're not, you know, virtual reality, but do you, do you guys play a lot of games yourselves? I was really into Overwatch when it was in its prime and a lot of, uh, not exactly the dynamics, but the player profiles, I guess, is the word of having the angry healer and having the tank who's your friend, but in real life, they're um, really soft and into all of the lore and stuff like that. So um, putting a little bit of Overwatch vibes into Renegade Rule really excited me and that was a lot of inspiration for me while we were writing it yeah we really wanted to try to capture through the four girls like people's different experiences in relationships with games and fandom so you have amanda who's just zeroed in and honed in on the competitive aspect uh tanya who's you know like my like the way i approach overwatch is i don't really play it but I read all the comics and I watch all the cinematics mm. and I scroll through the wikis. Like I just love the characters and the lore, even if I'm not as engaged with the gameplay. So, you know, people who just want to like, you know, Jesse early on, especially someone who is more into having fun and messing around and taking the rules of the game and just seeing what they can break just for the sake of breaking it. Uh, so hopefully people either say like can read this book and go like, oh, that's how I play games, or, oh, I totally have a friend who plays exactly like that. Just trying to create those relatable experiences. And in terms of me, for gaming, um, you know, the big influences in, especially how the game in the, how the game of Renegade Rule is structured, these, this four-on-four uh, shooter team matches, it's definitely inspired by Team Fortress 2 and especially Overwatch with all the wide variety of classes. Uh, me personally, I love uh, shooters, but I don't need other people to be so much better than me and let me know how not good at them I actually am. So oh. I like single player where I can just feel like a badass fighting computers. So <laughs> I'm super into all like the single player uh, first person shooters. Like I love the Halo trilogy, uh, all the Halo games, uh, Half Life Two. Uh, Doom, I'm like uh, the Doom reboot game is in 20 from 2016 is one of my all time favorites. So I always so I've got a big big love for the shooter genre, but I approach it from the standpoint of being a total story dork. Right, right, and you know I relate to that as a an RPG player because I think you know people come to games with different things. Some people want to just be able to deal damage, and I. I don't quite understand the appeal of that when it's not real, but I, I'm interested in the characters and the aesthetics and the story development and all those dynamics. No, I'll tell you, sometimes I feel like, uh, you know, I got into games really, I mean, you know, there was always Donkey Kong and Mario, but really right, the game right. that made me open my eyes and go like, oh, this is a life-changing experience. I did not know video games could be like this. I did not know narrative experiences could be like this was the first time I played Final Fantasy X in 2001. Hmm. I, I would have been 11. And Final <laughs> Fantasy X, again, my experience with gaming at that point was 
Donkey Kong Mario, if you really want to get crazy, you throw in a little Star Fox and Crazy Taxi. And then here was this world, tra- like across multiple worlds, across time, across space. This epic, huge world full of lore and characters and romance and just... I didn't know games could be that way. It was this like Dragon Ball Z and Final Fantasy X kind of was this 2000, 2001, this one-two punch where just all of the rules of what my little child brain knew about narrative went completely out the window. Yeah, totally. Like, I mean, in what, because of the way it was more immersive or or how? Yeah, yeah I mean, totally in terms of the immersiveness, but just again, like I was dealing with, you know, the stories that I knew about video games were, oh, Bowser's kidnapped Princess Peach, so Mario's got to do the levels and he's going to rescue her, mm-hmm. but not really because there's no way I'm ever actually making it to the end of a Mario game. <laughs> not happening. Going get, gonna to get halfway through and then it's going to get too hard. I'm going to stop just like I always do. And then, you know, Final Fantasy, it's a, a young professional athlete dealing with so many issues of insecurity surrounding his father is dealt with in a world destroyed by this Lovecraftian monster, then transported across time and meets all these people in a world of religious extremism. And it it was beyond it. It's like going from, you know, Rainbow Fish to the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy. I don't know what Rainbow Fish is, but I am nodding nonetheless. Like, insert any... You know, the very hungry caterpillar. Uh, okay, got you it. You know, the little, the choo-choo that made it all the way. <laughs> the little engine that could. <laughs> got it, got The got choo-choo it. that made it all the way. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Are there dynamics of playing, like, MM, I'm going to completely, I'm very embarrassing myself, but, like, massive multiplayer games um, with people who are not your friends and are not your team that kind of make their way into the dynamics and the, the conflicts of the story? I don't think that was really an element to it. And maybe it's just, Rachel, um, please feel free to like, jump in on here, but like, mm-hmm. I personally don't have a ton of experience with MMORPGs, and I know for a lot of people... Uh, that is what playing with friends is. It's meeting new people and forming these bonds with people across the world. But I think with Renegade Rule, the kind of game experience that I had in my head that I really wanted to kind of harken back to and celebrate was just all the weekends. I like, you know, me and a friend, like me and few, like four friends just crowding around in like a friend's basement, just playing Halo into like, th- until like 3 a.m. in the morning. And, like, just all being, like, crammed together in the living room, just playing round after round of just shooter games, having fun. Like, that was kind of the gaming with friends experience I really wanted to just, like, pay tribute to. Do you feel like there's something unique about, like, playing games as queer people? I find that, I mean, at least for me, when I would play Overwatch, I mean, I would play competitively sometimes, and I would go out of my way to find, like... Overwatch is 6v6, so I would try to find either, uh, m- well, mostly just fellow queer friends who wanted to play with me. We used to have what was called the Overwatch Girl Gang, which was just a bunch of us queer friends. There were like 12 of us, and we would um, kind of like rotate out playing together, and we would play competitively. So That's amazing. That, I, lo- yeah, I love that. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And collaboratively, basically, too, in a lot right. of ways, right? Right. Do you feel like this is a story that you want to continue in a future volume, perhaps? We definitely have ideas for volume two. There's certain aspects of the characters that we intentionally left unexplored or kind of teased at in terms of what the emotional through line of this book would be. I think kind of if... The, if Amanda is really kind of the true North and her making her way through and her relationship with Gabby is kind of the main thrust of Renegade Rule Volume 1, uh, Volume 2 would, I think, shift the emotional, would kind of shift the main emotional stakes uh, to a place where I think if you read the book, I think you'll kind of know where we'd want to take it. 
uh, without spoiling it. And then yeah, I I, I, I do. <laughs> yes, and then uh, I think the really just the genre of shooter games has evolved since we've uh, you know started work on Volume One. Uh, kind of the main thrust has shifted from Overwatch to you know, more games like stuff like uh, Fortnite. And I think we'd really have to look at how the genre of shooters has evolved and tr- and really uh, have that be our guide in how to evolve things and kind of make things bigger and better for a sequel. Plus, we also want to see what happens next. Aw, and so do I. I'm invested. <laughs> I really enjoy the characters. My, I hope that wasn't... Fa- too much spoilers mm-hmm. to say Fortnite, but I feel like if I'm going to say where the shooter genre has gone, then Fortnite is the 800 pound gorilla in the room. <laughs> yeah, like it's kind of obvious. Yeah, I wouldn't worry. I, but you know, the the um one of the things that made me message B with enthusiasm while I was reading this was when the team runs into a team that's just gender swapped them and seems to not like like one of them is kind of like, wait, and everybody else is just sort of like, no, this, I'm sure this is not a thing. I, for some reason, that particular narrative convention always cracks me up. That was just pure, fun, you know, rowdy, rough boys. Like, I I don't know, something <laughs> just so fun and silly about like the whole gender swap team, like doppelganger. I, I don't know. I'm great. I don't even Rachel. I don't even remember how we first came up with it, but it was just so much fun to work that, on. Yeah, they were. I think out of all the characters or like the other teams that we had to come up with, they were definitely my favorite. They were definitely the ones we put the most work into because I feel like it was a product of however much work we put into the original characters. We then had to kind of put a similar amount of work to make sure their doppelgangers like matched right. 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 And I, I I don't know exactly why that always tickles my fancy, but it just it just does. And especially when like one of them sees that two of those characters are in a relationship and then is like, wait, does this mean that I'm supposed to be in a relationship with my equivalent on my team? Like mm-hmm. you can do something a lot of, surreal about it, I enjoy. You can do a lot of fun foils stuff with that and showing like, you know, how where these characters might be if they were slightly different or different places in their dynamics. Totally. I guess it's like having an AU built into your story. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, I like that. That's it. That's it exactly. <laughs> Though I do like that we got uh, – one of my goals was definitely to work in a bakery AU fanfic joke, and I was happy that we got that – we worked that in. You did. You did indeed. <laughs> well, one of the fun things with the series is I really enjoy – there's a there's a bisexual couple who's like one of the main couples um, – and uh, it's a it's a you know a, a man and a woman and they're just both very queer and very enthusiastic and very much like avoidant of the bullshit stereotypes that are really exhausting and I, that I don't need to see any more of which of course is what you get when you get queer people actually you know <laughs> writing things although funny again, how but, that works <laughs> oh but you know, but it's even specific identities I mean plenty of stuff by cis gay men has been like really bad about that frankly too so. Yeah, I mean, as someone who's in a, you know, a really woman non-binary relationship uh, that, you know, I kind of have to put a lot of work into presenting the way I most prefer to present. And one of the benefits of that is that we become visibly a queer couple. Um, So I know, but as a result, like most of the time we go out, people just see a opposite gendered couple which can be just and you know how it can be just invalidating yes and <laughs> visible flying in its own ways so what yeah. are the goals definitely one of the hopes was with uh jesse and jesse boyfriend we know his name we don't we won't reveal it but we know his name yes <laughs> uh, was to present a opposite gender relationship that was still visibly queer and had queerness at its core and, and and the other characters just like going along with it and like not having any sort of questioning of, you know, the, whether this is legitimate or adequate I, or whatever. I could, I, God, no, I can't replicate the scenes of L Word where it's just horrible bullying and invalidating of identities under the guise of witty banter. 
Yeah. Yeah. It, it's so, and they, and what's amazing is they think that they're, that they're telling us something we don't know already. Uh, it's, that's a whole other podcast for a whole other time. Well, I, 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 this, this, this episode the will L be coming words, out. Yeah. This episode will be coming out. Oh, to be clear, I've literally never watched The L Word because I could tell it was terrible. Me and my partner tried to watch L Word and we noped the fuck out in season two when the main character discovers that her male roommate has been secretly, secretly filming her yeah. for months. And her only reaction is to be upset because the secret filming caught her girlfriend cheating on her. <laughs> no, there's that just... was what she got angry about. I, and that was, yeah. the, I don't know what happens after that because we're like, we're done with this show, right? It's like, yeah, we're very done with this show. Honest question, did any queer women work on writing it or... or at all i don't i don't yeah, whatever i just was like not gonna fucking watch it um but yes everybody no. treats bisexual shitty and we're, we're moving right along although i will say that um you can't see me but it, i'm nodding my head right now yes <laughs> i sense it internally I, I will say though you know this episode is coming out during pride month for sure and um this has just been such an exhausting season of discourse and you know made more so by the fact that we just can't really be in person with people until like now, basically. Yeah. I think it hasn't it hasn't been it hasn't been healthy and you see just so much worse stuff coming out when people don't have the opportunity to interact with anybody One IRL. Of the goals of Renegade Rule was definitely to present a book and a world that just allows for queer joy. Just people not having to deal with traumatic coming outs, not having to deal with uh, bullying or harassment in pro gaming sphere, just a world where people can be queer and joyously, openly celebratory queer and also just be crazy kick ass like esports gamers. Yeah, it's a nice thing to get away there. And like, you know, I just love seeing the exterior, the exterior image of Stonewall from people who like actually know that, right? That was fun putting in. It is. It was. That was. And yeah, no, especially since that's kind of become a, not a monument, like an official landmark monument. It just felt mm -hmm. like for a queer book really celebrating Manhattan, it just felt like if we're going to bring them to a bar, it can't not be Stonewall. Right, right. You know, I, you know, I live in Brooklyn and I've been working in community organizing and like fighting for affordable housing and all these other issues for a million years. But I, I still find it exhausting when people say things like, oh, Manhattan is completely gentrified. And I'd like to point out that while shit is fucked up, there is public housing in Manhattan. There is permanent affordable housing in Manhattan that people, the residents of those neighborhoods have fought tooth and nail to have like a foothold in. Um, you know, Manhattan South is like, continues to be you know an existent like working class and middle class community because that is you know that's who that's who's running it that's the like, people have worked to make that happen and like people writing out like it's extraordinarily hard to be you know a working class or even middle class person in manhattan but like they exist they are real yeah. it's the product of like actual organizing and struggles that people have had for literal generations and just being like oh whatever manhattan is bullshit is erasure Kinda? Yeah, it, invalidating all the good work that's been done. And I don't know, living here, I'm I'm grateful to be in a neighborhood where I can be openly and present uh, trans femme and without feeling unsafe. That's a yeah, it's a luxury to be safe being myself. That's really powerful. So I definitely recommend this book uh, on the long the New York axis of interests, as well as the queer, as well as the video game stuff, which is like over my head. But like, Look, kind we're of probably not going to be getting Knicks versus Nets in the NBA playoffs this year. But you know what? You can still pick up Renegade Rule and get a Subway series. Oh, good point. I wonder when Roller Derby is coming back. Ooh, that'd be great. That was actually one of the, that was one of the, I don't know, genres. that's one of the activities that kind of popped up in my head reading this as well as sort of a parallel. Like you have people creating alt, alt, alternate egos and there's a ton of queer women. There's something, I think there is a lot of that commonality in creating this, again, queer solidarity and friendship and then you, and then 
having that be a springboard to just celebration of new identities and creating mm-hmm. guises for yourself to just let out whatever you're looking to get out. Now, you know, B's been on the show before, but I haven't spoken with you before, Rachel. What What is it about the comics medium that appeals to you as a writer or as a reader, too? Well, I definitely started off as a reader and... I don't know. I, as much as I love good art, and I definitely love art, I have a crazy art collection. I always was kind of drawn to good writing in comics, which obviously there's plenty of good writers out there. But Ben, I'm going to use you for example. I fucking love your writing. And I know I've, I've said that to you a million times. But, you know, I could read your stories. And I feel like I could read them without any art. And it would, you know, I would still be completely immersed. So I know that when I started writing Renegade Rule and some other comics that I've been working on, I kind of, you know, looked up to you a bit. And I wanted to be able, I know, I wanted to be able to write something myself where I can have that same effect on people. And yeah. Are there, what are the, what are sort of your big comics influences? For me, um, I just I really love like cheesy fluffy comics. I know that's kind of lame, but um, there is nothing favorite... lame, nothing lame about cheesy fluffy comics. Cheesy <laughs> fluffy comics rock. <laughs> yeah, it's like if it's gonna the closer it is to like a tropey fan fiction, the more I like it. You know, it's interesting because I have a like a medium sweet tooth, not like a super high appetite for fluff, but not like a not a not a, like a reflexive anti either. I'm like kind of feel like I'm in the middle, and this definitely wasn't too sweet for me, and I um I would not have necessarily made those assumptions. So I feel like you guys have made something that's accessible to the less not like the less the less hyper sweet tooth oriented people as well. Yeah. And people, I don't know if it's like, I don't know, it's probably because it's a queer show, but I got a lot of like fluffy stuff pushed my way that I'm like, eh, I want to support you, but I don't really care. <laughs> um, so it was nice to be like, no, I, I straight up really enjoy this. This is good. I think it's, you know, I think there's something that's one of the great appeals of sports stories is that it can be something that can be light, that can be fun, that can have relatively low stakes full of people that are good friendly people yet is still inherently driven by a zero-sum conflict right that's a good point it's you know you can have all the fluffy people you want but at the end of the day one character is going to win and one character is going to lose and that to me is one of the most interesting things about sports stories is the way it can present zero-sum conflict without villainizing either side do you got what i i am like at this point years behind but do you do you guys read the comic fence i did read the first volume of that i didn't is that the, uh, that's the one about fencing right yes. yeah at the, okay yep i never read it yeah, I think you we would probably from from the amount of it I've read, I feel like you would definitely be interested. Actually, I, I should say this to, to fr- folks who are fans of Fence, definitely check out this comic. <laughs> yeah, I think it's in terms of I think it's again, I think Fence had a lot of those same uh sports manga influences that mm-hmm. Renegade Rule has. So yeah, I I do think that again, having just read the first volume of it, I think that if you do enjoy Fence, you will have a lot to love in Renegade Rule. Awesome. So what what comics are you guys reading these days? I am sadly, sadly not reading any at the moment. I'm working on them. Like I'm writing my own, but Ooh. I just, I had my law school graduation yesterday. So it's been- Oh my God, Mazel Tov. Thank you. It's, it's, Yay. it's been a long road studying for the bar exam, which is in July. So I haven't had any Brutal. time to sit down and gorge comics yet. Well, I'll try to spread the love uh, Marvel, DC, and indie. Uh, on the Marvel side, I'm honestly just reading a ton of X-Men. Aren't I'm we all? <laughs> reading, I'm reading most everything coming out of the X line of books right now. Uh, I am just so into this absolute sci-fi epic that is being told. 
Uh, on the DC side, I am really enjoying the two-color anthologies they've started doing. Superman Red and Blue, Batman Black and White. Uh, I think their Wonder Woman Black and Gold is going to be joining them. And just spectacular short stories with incredible art. Um, and again, honestly, I just love the two-color team that adds so much atmosphere and feel to it. Hmm. Uh, so those have been real. Um, you know, I'm someone that's usually not super into anthologies but maybe it's just because superman batman wonder woman are so iconic and recognizable they work easier for me in short story format maybe it's just because they're getting the best damn writers and artists around to work on some of these short oh, stories yeah, for real i haven't read uh, them and i do mean to and actually we had um michelle fife on the podcast right when they announced he was going to be working on the superman red and blue one I, that's I so should, cool yeah he's and fabulous then, uh, in the in the world of indie, uh, the new arc of Die has just started up that you were just talking about, and I am so excited. It is just one of the absolute best books on stand. So uh, every week that it comes out, Die is my the first book I read. Yeah, it really is fabulous. I think I like made an audible jaw dropping sound. Um, when a particular science fiction author whose name I won't mention, right? but whose right? work I, I've always loved showed up and the way that character was used in the story, I was like, yes. Yep. Okay. I know exactly who you're talking about. And yup. And then riding yup. off, riding off on a bicycle. <laughs> Goodbye. Yup. Oh God. Anyway. Yeah. That's been a great read. I know I've been behind in my reading as well, but I, I do like, I'm way behind. Well, actually, no, I'm mildly behind on my X-Men reading. And yeah, that book is still really, Fabulous. I mean, I, um, it sounds like there's some frustrating stuff that just happened, but I will be taking a look at it and, uh, hoping that they continue to diversify the creative teams working on them. Um, because there's some amazing folks in there, but if you're going to do X-Men, you, you got to get fewer white men. I think that's sort of important. <sighs> well, I want to thank you guys for joining me. I, are there other are parts of working on this book together that really surprised you as being particularly hard or, or easy that kind of like, is this is a new team up for you all? I mean, really just, it was so much fun. I mean, I, this was a co-writing experience where we were either in person or doing a vid call uh, for every panel, every line of dialogue. This was every single element. It was 100% us doing it back and forth like right then and there like absolute co-writing and honestly it was just so much fun it was just writing a comic while hanging out oh that sounds like a good way to spend some time during covid were, were you guys working on it during this or is it older than that it's actually way before it which was nice yeah. that we were able to meet in person many times and finish it up but yes um this was originally going to come out October 2020, but then oh boy, everything with COVID um, and ended up uh, now with uh, June 2021. So just in time for Pride. Well, it feels very fresh to me, so don't worry about that. Not that I'm assuming yeah. you were, but to anyone who's <laughs> wondered. Well, we, uh. we were setting it in the slight future, and we looked and we figured American healthcare still being a joke was still was a probably safe prediction for the future. Yes, sadly. Um, yeah, I can go through an international global health crisis and people will still be like, no, universal health care is bad for the economy, question mark? It's, mm, it's actually not, motherfuckers. And the economy isn't a person. <laughs> um, sure isn't. Like, literally, the worst people need to stop. It's apparently um, the nameless, faceless god we have to sacrifice hundreds of thousands to. There's a really amazing set of writing about um, the way the economy is discussed as either a singular external force, like a force of nature that exists beyond human impact, or like a god, basically, um, that um, Heather McGee, who... Uh, at least what well, I think I think she still is running the think tank Demos as someone who's spoken up who like has done a lot of writing about that. And it was so enlightening for me. I was like, that is how they talk about it. And it is a huge problem, <laughs> like putting words to it. 
I guess that's also an example of the of you know how narrative and storytelling works in our political fiction, like of the real world, like the political fiction that exists of the real world that shapes the political choices and decisions that are made in it's government. It's like we're we're using different words and terms, but people are just singing the same old songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, um, you know, I I remember when we were trying to get the uh, paid sick days bill passed in New York City Council. And then Speaker Chris Quinn kept being like, well, we'll have to see how the economy is feeling. We're like, are, are you going to ask it? Like, are, are you going to buy coffee first? Like, it's Look, not it's a person. He got, he got some lamb bones in a special cup that the witch in the forest gave him. He's going to shake the bones in the cup and then we'll see the pattern they fall in. And that'll let us know if the economy can handle people having paid sick days. <laughs> well, I want I want to I want to thank you guys for coming and for bringing such great, exciting energy. Um Perhaps I might see some of you in person at the upcoming Queer March if folks feel secure out and about. It happens concurrent to Corporate Pride. Actually, Corporate Pride is canceled this year, I think. <laughs> so it happens the day that Corporate Pride would be happening. But um, mm-hmm. And I guess to my listeners, I would say, oh, my God, New York, we have a municipal election June 22nd. And you need to vote in it. It's the most important election in the city. Whoever wins the primary is going to win the general, basically. Um, Feel free to tweet at me any questions you have about who the hell to vote for or who to volunteer for, because I know candidates really benefit from your help. Um, I I definitely have questions because the candidate I was planning on voting for just fired all of her staff. Yeah, that was really complicated and shitty. We should totally talk about the nonprofit industrial complex with respect to that at some time. But yeah, that just got real complicated. I... I feel like I'm almost scared because stuff is moving so fast. But like, for, as to say this on a podcast, that'll probably be coming out next week. But like, as of right now, I, I think my ballot is going to be number one, Ms. Maya Wiley. And then I got to make decisions about which of the people who have disappointed me will be coming in number two. Um, it's been the, it has been a time this mayoral election. I, I, it's it's the election that has just eaten like a meal. And there's so much energy coming from volunteers and activists. And it's just that there's literally every city council district is up for is up for a new seat, right? More or less. And um, the mayor and the comptroller and the district attorney of Manhattan and the borough president of Brooklyn, like all at the same time. So people are getting pulled in a million different you directions. Could- you could totally make a documentary about this. The problem is it would be directed by Christopher Guest. <laughs> so long as it's not directed by Aaron Sorkin. That's so long as that does not happen. I do not need his Sorkinian take on New York politics. I do the West Wing has done enough. We've we've heard enough from the West Wing. Oh, it like poisoned the brains of a generation. I, I will say so that my endorsement for Manhattan Borough President is former podcast guest, comics reader, and like government, like total policy wonk and good guy all around, Ben Kalos, city councilman of uh, Kipps Bay area, Upper East Side of Manhattan, running for Manhattan Borough President. Vote for, vote for Ben. Um, and if folks want to hear more from him, we had a long conversation about superhero comics back a number of months ago, you can check out on the podcast that about growing up in New York City as a comics fan, which I mean, be, be, be you're from here, right? So I'm from about I'm from a suburb about like 50 minutes away from the city. proper. Ah, OK, yeah. So that was like me. I was like from not from I'm not from right outside New York. I'm from right outside D.C. And I sort of grew up going to the city all the time. I just sort of had a really yeah strong identification. Any ex- Absolutely. Like any excuse I had growing up to get into the city, I would take and just I just felt so home and just this sense of belonging whenever I was in the city. Like I dreamed my entire life of just living truly in New York. But it, no, it was still totally that, you know, that tri-state area, southern Connecticut, New York news is still local news. Yeah, you're definitely in the same media market. Um. And Rachel, we'll have to we'll have to come and hang out in the city sometime. I I, I found out that FlameCon is understandably going to be online this year, but I will be hoping to see everybody in person at FlameCon next year for sure. So, Hell and yeah. as for you, yes, yeah. And as for you, listeners, um, feel free to shoot me your questions about who the hell to vote for. I'm on Twitter at e l a n a underscore Brooklyn. That's e l a n a underscore Brooklyn. Um, You know, and let's get your volunteer energy out and about. It's canvassing is going to be wonderful right now. People are just happy to go out and be in the sun and talk and like talk with their neighbors about voting. 
And um, tell our listeners where they can find you guys online. I'm on Twitter at, at Flirty Mango. You can... Oh. You have to tell me the origin of your handle now. That's the rule. Oh, it's um, a skin to mitt shaving cream flavor. <laughs> That's the origin. <laughs> I'll probably get sued for saying that one day, but yeah, that no. was my inspiration. I also I really actually just it. made a website that's kind of like a, a CV for me. So it's theflirtymango.com. That's awesome. I appreciate your brand yeah. and your <laughs> it's a good brand. potential aromas. No. <laughs> and Ben, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me at Twitter at, at Ben the Con. You can find links to my past comics like Shaman, Heavenly Blues, and Griffin Galaxy's Most Wanted at my website, BenConComics.com, or on Comixology. And you can also tune in every Friday night where I co host uh, the Progressively Horrified podcast with Jeremy Whitley and Emily Martin. And I believe I just got a notification that you will be uh, joining us again uh, pretty soon for Hellraiser oh, 2. Apparently I'm the official guest for all things Hellraiser, which is exciting. I loved being on your podcast. It was a total blast. Ben, you have to share the uh, podcast tagline with our listeners. Oh, yes. Uh, putting Progressively horrified. Putting horror movies through political lenses that it never asked to be put <laughs> <Yeah>. through. <laughs> it was like the standards they were never asked to. Uh, God, yeah, it was. It's, it's great. I yeah. really enjoyed the show. Good conversation. Smart guests. And um, it's just not the same coming from me instead of Jeremy's wonderful. Baritone. He does have a good way to intro it. Um, so, yeah, folks should check out when I was on their show to talk about Hellraiser because that was a fabulous episode. It's like long but worth it. I've been told. I've been told by others. Um, and I really I really do enjoy your podcast and I'm excited to come back. Yay. So to our listeners, Graphic Policy Radio is on every podcast platform. But one thing I've noticed is that we don't have a ton of reviews. And some of the reviews we have are from back when our audio sucked. I think my brother has done a fabulous job cleaning up our audio and polishing it. And I want, in in the honor of my brother and his awesome contributions, I, I really do want to see some new reviews of the podcast on whatever platform it is you're listening to. I swear to you, this will take two minutes of your time. And I will be eternally grateful to you because that is one of the most helpful things you can do to help promote the podcast and help keep it going. And with that in mind, as we like to say, keep it geeky. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos. Or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.